Hello and welcome to SFDC Sessions for the week of June 7th. My name is Elisa Carroll and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Henry Magazine. You can find us online at henrymag.com. This week we are so excited to welcome Doug Garfinkel, who is the Creative Director of Dongia, and he is here to talk to us about the very exciting relaunch of this iconic house uh, Doug, thank you so much for taking the time out of all of your work and celebrations this week to be with us. It is a big week. Thank you, Elisa, for taking the time to highlight our new acquisition. We're very excited to bring this product back to the marketplace. Well, I know the whole design community is obviously um, buzzing about it and is so excited to see what um, this very storied, you know, legacy company is now going to um, off be offering in its next in its next life. So, you know, I thought maybe for a moment before we kind of get to the new offerings, we could take a moment and look at the, um, the really rich and multi-layered history of the, of the firm, starting with, of course, Angelo Dongia. Um, would you mind sharing a bit of that origin story with us? No, I love to because for me, it's actually a new education as well. So again, since um, being honored with this role of creative director required a lot of research as well. And although I grew up with Dongi as a brand, didn't know much about Angelo. And of course, the topic is so timely, given the fact of, um, you know, this current 70s um, fascination, uh, the Halston series and so and so. Um, but with it, within that, when um, Angelo graduated from Parsons, he you know says that his most pivotal moment in his I guess professional career was his first job um, as he applied for at the Yale, uh, firm of Yale Birch, who was an antique dealer and designer in New York City, and this was his first and only boss because from that he was made a partner in the firm, um, and from that when Yale Birch um, passed away in 1972, Birch. Dongia became Dongia Associates. Um, and so this was pivotal. And while he was there, or one of the things I discovered, which was the beauty of Angelo Dongia, not unlike the Kravit organization, he was insatiable as far as his ambitions in business. If you watch the documentary or you hear about Angelo, you'll always hear him saying, I want to be bigger and better. And that's actually how he grew his business from when he started in 1968 with and vice versa, which were his um, um, proprietary textiles. Um, that he partnered with a friend of his, Seymour Avigdor, and they were beautiful, wonderful, fun geometrics, and that became Dongia Textiles. Then he formed Dongia Furniture, um, and, and of course his design firm, Dongia Associates. So he grew and grew and grew, and you know, unfortunately until his passing in 1985, you know, it said as we look at it saying, who would he have become today? You know, the Ralph Lauren or the Martha Stewart of this world, because he just always saw bigger and better. And that's really the origins of all those um, companies that he began. Yes, yes, such a pioneer in that way. And, and for bringing, if I'm correct, um, his collections to a bigger and broader market, right? The well, yeah, one of the first. Clients. Yeah. Totally. So within that history that I went over so briefly, um, you know, Angela was probably one of the first to, again, from the interior design perspective, wanting to bring his perspective to a larger audience. And so he was one of the first to do licensing and he did licensing with several brands of dishes, glasses, furniture, um, and went on sheeting. And uh, some of his sheeting was some of the best selling that he had done. So again, early on, very much expanding the, you know, the Dongia um, lifestyle brand. Um, and he, early on as well, in some of his commissions um, in 1966, the Metropolitan Opera Club, which is famous, which really brought him as well a lot of respect in the New York social scene, this mix of product um, that was quite eclectic. So his signature silver foil ceilings, um, the darker used the very sensual tones of chocolates and blacks and black leather and Regency furniture. So combinations that were not necessarily seen at that particular time um, made him quite um, renowned. And as you shared, there is a fun moment in the zeitgeist right now, because at that pivotal moment, I believe is when he crossed paths um, with Halston, yes, and as everyone is, is saying right now, and in loving that miniseries, um, he makes obviously an intersection with the world of fashion. So Angelo's own style, from what I had just mentioned, and then looking at his, you know, townhouse on the York East side and, and his celebrity clients, such as actually Liza Minnelli, uh, you know, to name one, Mary Tyler Moore, um, and then ultimately with Ricky and Ralph Lauren. And when he did their penthouse in New York, and the pictures, again, are quite iconic of the white furniture, similar to the Manhattan sectional, that's one of Donya's best-selling pieces that was brought back later 
um, in the series, uh, rather in our um, line, and we're actually offering it back now as well. So when you look at Halston's evolution, I'm not sure what, how much Halston influenced Angelo Dangia as they were friends, or Angelo Dangia influenced Halston, but they definitely latched onto each other's star and their um, styles um, evolved accordingly. And as you shared with me, which was really fun, um, Dongia created the tenting for the first Halston runway show in New York. Most people don't know this, but um, in the first uh, series or the first episode of the, of the series, um, he's touring his raw studio with Angelo Dongia. But Halston just says, Angelo, you have to help me do this. And Angelo says, you can't afford me. So yes, we're all watching this going, well, of course, that's Angelo Dongia. Um, and yeah, and the next scene goes to that actually Angelo does do this for him. And he completely drapes the entire studio in a fabric that he went to the garment district for. And, uh, you know, that becomes quite an iconic scene as well. And it's later on that you, you see in Halston's townhouse and in Stella, and this is all the rage now, there's probably as many articles written about um, the interiors of Halston, not just of his Fifth Avenue office, but also, again, of his townhouse. And you're seeing this sort of sleek modernism that emerges from it, this minimalist design, which is closer to what Angelo did again for Ricky and Ralph Lauren. So it's interesting how the styles merge together. And isn't that interesting, that DNA um, has distilled now to become um, sort of your new um, calling card, well, not new, but for the relaunch, which is, if I'm correct, modern elegance. Yeah, and I think those two words together, I'm, I'm glad you bring up those words, because we really, you know, again, um, filtered those through so many people, so many channels, and came down to modern elegance, which again, is typical of the Dangia brand to be very simple and straightforward. But those two words juxtapose each other as well, in having modern and yet this, this elegant way of living. And while the last iteration of Dongia, knowing when you know it was under the guise of Rubelli and the showrooms that we so well remember, um, were very aspirational, very international, but extremely modern. Um, but when you speak to um, those designers that really have this love of Dongia, there's many personalities. But all in all, if we go back to Angelo, would, and you watch again these documentaries, he's, he talked so passionately about the art of living and doing things elegantly, whether you were dancing or eating or walking down the street. And I, I, I do think, though, he was always pushing the boundaries, going back to some of his mentors like Jean-Michel Frag, and, you know, paring down dining ta or coffee tables to a, min a minimalist line and always looking at taking what was classic and cleaning it up and, and doing something different to it that really then brought it into sort of the modern iconography that we know as Dangia furniture today. It's amazing really to go back and explore that as kind of a primer, as you say, for the, for the language that we're using still. Um, and you had also shared, obviously, that Sherry Dongia, his cousin, um, led the, the firm for 20 years and had a very different aesthetic. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit, yeah, about her, how, about her, how her style informs the DNA? I, I, I know she's going to watch this. I would love for you to interview her exactly. But I had the fortunate experience um, after acquiring this role to speak to Sherry for about an hour, an hour and a half on the phone. She was ge very generous with her time. And I, I think, again, when I look at that period, Angelo passed away in 1985. And to bring in, you know, a namesake of Sherry Dongy in 1987 to the company, really to carry on that tradition, um, understanding she'd never actually worked for Angelo, but again, of course, knew him intimately. Um, and Sherry's background um, is not only as a textile designer, but was also in fashion. Um, and again, she herself, aside from Dongi, has an extremely prestigious and renowned career in textile design and fashion, um, and really explored that side of it. So the some of the iconic fabrics that we um, know of Dongi, such as the giant Suzani, or some of these wonderful um, batik damas um, that were done, and again, some whimsical product as well, such as um, Au Marche that we're going to bring back next year, which is the women carrying the baskets on their heads. Um, so Sherry brought this fun side, and when you speak to Sherry and her experience at Dangia, it really was about fun. It was about her team and this collaborative effort. She worked with John Hutton on the furniture. And they also expanded then and were going over to Paris for Maison Objet, Decoa, for what were the exhibitions at the time, and really bringing that Dangia language to Europe as well. I think that really is her legacy within, um, you know, sort of that Dangia 20 years.
it's really wonderful to bring um, that legacy to the forefront at the moment. Um, you know, that's something I wasn't particularly familiar with being sort of next generation. It's really um, inspiring to hear about a particular woman who had leadership of this global company. Yeah. And on that note, I'm remiss to say that actually one of Sherry's keywords also within, you know, again, I guess the Dongi framework was innovation. And they really explored innovation in textiles. And again, as I said, she's such a textile designer. So there were shears with metallics before this was done and on and on. And as she talks about them so passionately, you just you just want to see this product brought back because it's also still so current. Well, now let's talk about that, can we? So you sure. said that you have, I believe it is 420 SKUs that you are introducing or re mm -hmm. some of them are reintroductions, some of them are new designs. Um, mm -hmm. Would you walk us through how you as the creative director um, sought to curate the brand for its next chapter, how you preserved its kind of deep structure, but breathe new life into it? So, so the first thing to say is that, you know, none of us work alone. I guess I'm going to do a plug now for the company, but, you know, I, this is, a, as I've told my about this is a dream job with a dream team. And I think Crab is probably one of the only companies that could have actually absorbed Dongia into its fold, yet respect the brand and do a thorough analysis. So Scott Kravitz, our chief creative officer, um, again, along with Steve Prater, our merchand merchandising officer, and myself, we you know distilled all the fabrics that were there, looked at what was current, what wasn't current, whether something actually didn't do well, um, was it in the last years of Dongia, but we still think it's current, and did a whole analysis. So we used a lot of intelligence to do that, as well as then our own you know aesthetics of saying, this is still current, let's push this forward. But from about 2,000 SKUs, we distilled it down to about 420. Then we brought on board uh, Myung Berger, who's our design director for Dongia. And again, as we move forward towards that, Myung has worked with Barbara Barry, with Leonard Hollingsworth. She's developed some of the most beautiful licensed collections that we do. And for us, Dongia, we're treating it almost as a licensed collection. And so working very closely with her. On the furniture end, we have Sarah Kravitz and Maria Brennan. Maria Brennan came from Century Furniture. Sarah Kravitz has joined the company a couple of years ago, actually quite a few now, and has really just, you know, taken on a full vision for furniture. So they have all made my life extremely easy, um, you know, again, in helping to curate and edit what was there. And again, even in the furniture, the 50 SKUs that we're going to bring back. Um, on the wall covering end, again, we're moving forward and looking forward and back to new product for Dongi as well. And then, of course, with the lighting, we inherited maybe some of the most beautiful Murano glass lighting, um, originally designed by John Hutton. And, and on top of all this, there's a wonderful gentleman named Gabriel Rossina, who was the head um, design director for furniture and lighting for Dongia. And we retained him um, as a consultant with us, both for bringing back the pieces and actually creating some new pieces for next spring. So I can't ask for a better team of people. Hopefully I didn't forget anybody, um, but that is definitely um, how it's been relatively painless in seven months to bring back this iconic brand to the marketplace. Wow, that is really meaningful, I would imagine, to be able to work with these individuals who have contributed so much to the house over the years and then bring in a fresh set of eyes as well and bring all of that together. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, it seems like something Angela would be very um, excited about. Um, well, and speaking of, can we turn for a moment to a few of the introductions that you're gonna be sharing? Um, a couple mm -hmm. of the fabrics and the wall coverings, we're going to look at the mohair and the bark cloth and the and the foils. Would you would you mind introducing us to a few of the new the new introductions? So again, in going back and just looking and seeing out of the 420, um, one of the things Dongi was so well known for, of course, were luxury textiles, luxury textures, and within the textures, actually velvets in particular, both here and in Europe. And again, over the years, we saw that some of the mohairs actually had dwindled down or they weren't currently colored. So we actually wanted to first introduce this incredibly beautiful quality called, it's called Versa, and it's a plush, very soft, um, mohair velvet coming from Belgium that will be introduced in 30 colors. And some of the colors are quite dynamic, burnt oranges and chartreuse greens. Of course, we're bringing in a lot of chocolate. As we talked about, um, you know, it's been a gray world, but we are going to bring chocolate back. 
Um, and again, all these wonderful combinations um, together. There are grays, there's hues of grays, neutrals as well, and turquoise blues. Um, so again, all the range within that. And it is it is a perfect skin, you know, to again put on to so much of the iconic Dongi furniture that we love so much. Um, on top of that, um, we are going to probably follow a very European path of one signature print per season. And this season, it's bark cloth. And this bark cloth is a supple um, boucle that then is screen printed with this geometric design. I think you're going to show some images of it. It's almost like a cracked ice design. And the origins come from Africa, uh, from bark cloth, which was actually taken off uh, you know, one of the native trees and then beaten down. And then once it was beaten down almost to in a paper form or again, and that's where the boucle comes in to sort of reproduce um, the texture of the bark cloth itself and then would have been hand painted. And so this came from the archives and this is introduced as well with a coordinated wall covering. And so th those are the two main introductions. Then lastly, again, my own love of foil um, and just seeing again so much of how, you know, Dangia saw the ceiling as that fifth wall and that, you know, it was just bringing that luminosity. Well, those were actually quite in, um, void in the Dongia line that we inherited. So we sourced um, the traditional foil from Japan, um, or they call it tea leaf. Um, so again, beautiful, beautiful quality um, in about uh, nine different traditional um, shades of both that, you know, range from the golds uh, to gilvers, um, again, and then into the silver foil. And on top of that, we again wanted to look back and look forward and are introducing what I call sort of liquid metal. And these are liquid metal foils. So they're extremely, extremely um, brilliant, almost mirror-like. And they come in brushed silver. So they reproduce the look of metal on walls. So we're going to give, again, that traditional look. And this is where we get into that, sort of, you know, again, modern elegance. We can go one way or the other. Well, and I would imagine, I don't know if this is your thought, but in San Francisco and in the Bay Area in particular, the foils and the reflection of light and the luminosity would be particularly beautiful, either either with the foggy setting or, or in the brilliant sun, it would be um, really quite wonderful. Um, and may I ask you, in, in that market, when you anticipate this will roll out in the Bay Area? Well, the fabrics actually, the 420 SKUs are already up in the San Francisco showroom. The one thing that's not there yet is the furniture. So as much as we wanted this coordinated launch, um, working within the bigger Kravit machine of all of our brands, we had a lot of introductions. So we wanted to get the fabrics back up in place. They're being followed by the bar cloth and they'll be followed actually by the foils. Um, some of the other existing wall coverings are actually arriving next week. I think they just um, they just shipped out as well. And there was quite an archive of these metallic grass cloths that Dongia was also known for and quite unique in the marketplace. So along all those traditions, we're going to move forward. But that product is there. The furniture will be arriving. Um, we did a dedicated setting in about 10 showrooms across the country. And those, including San Francisco, um, should be there by the end of June, if not mid-July. I believe I have to check on, you're catching me off guard now on the San Francisco dates, but I, it was over a certain period of time. But San Francisco definitely is a strong market for um, Dongia, and we have a beautiful dedicated setting that for those of us that know the showroom, will go right in sort of that glass window as you approach the showroom. Oh my gosh, that's really exciting. So there'll be a really a midsummer boost to look forward to with all of the furnishings coming in. And I believe the Ronaldo, sorry, I'm interrupt, but I believe the Ronaldo chandelier is already up in that window because um, we had actually um, taken it from um, the previous showroom and installed it. So that's already up. The exciting part of all that is that up until now, we um, did not have the furniture or the lighting tear sheets available. But as of June 1st, which was again, we keep saying every month is Dongia month, um, the website is now up and live. And it's a beautifully branded um, piece that we worked really hard on um, again since November uh, to bring this so that now all the product, fabric, furniture, lighting, and um, eventually floor covering, a little secret, uh, we'll be expanding this lifestyle brand to include floor covering as well, on all, all through the Dongia filter. And that is so wonderful, isn't it? It's to conceive of it as a full lifestyle brand now that you have the, as you said, all of the aspects of, of interiors and to find all of that at Kravit, um, which is such a, a phenomenal company. Um, and may I ask you, Doug, personally, you know, as you've shared, you have been with Kravit for over 24 years. 
How did it feel personally to kind of step into this role of shepherding this iconic house? Uh, you know, again, I grew up with Dagia, knowing Dagia, um, and again, and just to see again both the showrooms grow into the aspirational showrooms that they were, and then to see the company close, like for myself and so many others, was a sad moment. And even though Dagia was a, a competitor, none of us want to see this in the industry. And so for Kravit, like years ago, on that when they bought Brunswick, I'm really rescued these iconic brands. We know that we're going to do the same justice to it. To be asked to lead the cause. Um, is an honor. Um, and as well, I think for, again, those, a lot of people listening, uh, 2020 was a year of self-reflection um, during the pandemic year and an evaluation of, you know, how we all want to live, what we want to do going forward. And I was looking for a change uh, for my experience. And I know that um, we'd spoken about that, being responsible for the design and merchandising of all of our corporate showrooms across the country and working with a team. So this allows me to work in a different creative way for the company, uh, continuing with them and, and just trying to do my best to lead my expertise um, or give my expertise to, to this cause. You put it so beautifully and so humbly. And I, I so appreciate the way that you always um, acknowledge and obviously give give proper respect to your team thank you to all of you again for for um for shepherding this beloved brand forward and bringing it back to us and for your um your meticulous care um in making sure that all of its history is honored as you as you introduce new collections so we look forward to hopefully seeing you out here Sometimes. Absolutely. San Francisco, again, uh, as I mentioned to you, I'm originally from Montreal. And for me, Montreal and San Francisco have this synergy. Um, there's just something about the city that always reminded me of Montreal as well. So I'm, I'm glad we're moving you know, past the no travel um, and getting back to travel and meeting in person. I love San Francisco. I love the market and the design center. And so look, definitely looking forward to being back and most likely introducing what I think will be even more exciting is a fall collection, which will be more a vision of what we are, you know, looking forward in that direction of Dangia. So yeah, very excited to be able to present that in person, hopefully one day. Yes, we look forward to toasting it in person, hopefully in the fall. And um, thank you so much again for taking the time amidst this big launch week. We wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to help us promote the brand, this iconic brand.